we start with the first talk, Don Foster and a strategic approach to assessing viability of OSS projects. <laughs> perfect. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Uh, my slides are already uploaded at fastwonderblog.com on my speaking page. So if you want the, the slides, that's where you can find them. I wanted to start by just quickly thanking the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for funding the Chaos Data Science Initiative. Foundation who also provides support for the Chaos Project. I'll start by telling you just a little tiny bit about me. I have been in the technology industry for well over 20 years, working mostly on open source software from within companies like Puppet, Intel, and VMware. I'm currently working on data science for the Chaos Project, where I'm also a governing board member and maintainer. I'm a board member of Open UK. I'm co-chair of the CNCF Contributor Strategy Technical Advisory Group. And I also have a PhD where I spent a few years researching how people collaborate within the Linux kernel. And I spent a lot of time thinking about open source project sustainability and viability. Obligatory XKCD. Uh, evaluating project viability and the risk that comes with it is important because it can really disrupt your business. It's also important to think about viability and risk as being on a continuum. Like most things in life, there, there are no sure bets and no technology is completely without risk. There are only projects that are more or less viable across a variety of categories. And whether you should embrace a project and accept the risk that comes with it is a business decision and a strategic decision that should take how you're using that project into account. Looking at the viability of projects, especially ones that have the potential to impact your business, is a good first step toward managing risk and reducing the chances of potential disruptions. It's particularly important to look at the viability of any open source projects that are critical for your ability to deliver products to your customers or your users. This could include products that are built on top of an open source technology where those open source projects are integrated into your products or infrastructure. If you couldn't easily swap out that project or technology with a drop-in replacement of a similar technology, you should be assessing the viability of that project and understanding any risks that might come with it. This talk will compare projects under neutral foundations versus those controlled by companies and look at how people leading and contributing the project can influence viability. The presentation will have details about how to assess project viability across four broad areas, governance, community, compliance and security, and strategy, which all impact the stability and overall viability of a project. Throughout each of these areas, there'll be discussions about techniques for measurement and which collections of metrics can be used for your evaluations. I wanted to start by talking about why it's important to think about who owns or controls an open source project, because it's something that many of us maybe don't spend as much time thinking about as we should. The project's governance documents can usually help you learn more about the ownership and control of a project, and from a risk perspective and a strategic perspective, you should be looking for projects with neutral governance where decisions are made by people from a variety of different companies, projects that are controlled by foundations and ones that are owned by an individual company can have very different dynamics and risks associated with using and contributing to those projects. Projects that don't have neutral governance are more likely to experience things like hostile ports or licensing changes that impact viability. One way we can mitigate some types of risk is by supporting projects that are under neutral foundations whenever possible. The CNCF, the Linux Foundation, Eclipse, Apache Software Foundation, those are all nice neutral foundations. However, it's not always clear whether a foundation is neutral or not. If the board of directors or leadership bodies are made up of people who work at a wide range of companies, especially competing companies, then that's a good indication that it's a neutral foundation. If board members are made up of people from a single company or maybe a couple of companies with very close ties, 
then it's not likely to be a neutral foundation. It can also have to look at the projects under that foundation. Were they originated at a single company, or did they come from a whole bunch of companies? Do those projects have leaders? If the board members are made up primarily of people from a single company or a couple of companies with really close ties, it's not likely to be a neutral foundation. Uh, one of the reasons that Kubernetes has been so successful is because Google contributed it to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Putting Kubernetes into a neutral foundation provided a level playing field where people from a whole bunch of different companies could work together as equals to create something that benefits the entire ecosystem. Open source projects that are controlled by a single company can be higher risk, and they can be less viable over the longer term because they operate at the whims of that company. And there's little recourse for outside contributors or users when that company decides to go in a direction that doesn't align with the expectations of the other participants within that community. For company-originated projects, consider the reputation of that company as a steward of open source projects. But also keep in mind that they can, they can change their strategy at some later date. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't contribute to or use open source projects that are owned by companies, but you should think about the risks that you're taking and whether that project is likely to be viable over the long term. In some cases, it totally makes a ton of sense to accept this higher risk. But you should at least try to make sure that you understand the risks that you're taking and how those risks could impact your company and your strategies. Along with the ownership of a project, there are quite a few different areas that you should look at as part of your viability assessment for a project, including governance, community, security and compliance, and strategy. And as I mentioned earlier, this is particularly important if a project is critical to your ability to deliver products to your customers or your users and couldn't easily be substituted with similar technology. Within the Chaos Project, we have a relatively new concept called metrics models, which are basically just collections of metrics that are intended to be implemented together to understand a broader concept in a little more detail. Because measuring project viability is a fairly complex task, it did not take long to realize that putting all of those metrics into a single metrics model was going to be too overwhelming. Uh, so these viability models were developed by Gary White from Verizon who ended up breaking it into four, these four viability models, each focused on a specific viability topic. So in this talk, I'll cover all four of Gary's project viability models, and throughout the rest of this talk, I'll discuss each of these four areas in more detail, followed by a discussion about how the metrics in the related model are used to measure each area. And the second link at the bottom of the slide is to a three-part blog post series that Gary wrote to help people understand the models and how to use them. So I encourage you to have a look at his blog posts. Governance can be found in all open source projects in one form or another, and it helps outline the expectations around roles and responsibilities, along with the decision-making processes. But it will vary quite a bit by the size of the project, Knowing how collaboration occurs and how decisions are made is vital to building a sustainable open source project because it means that people are able to make contributions that are more likely to be accepted. If the processes for collaboration, leadership, and decision making are not clearly documented as part of the project governance, this can increase the risk of participating in or using the project because it just introduces a lot of uncertainty into the mix. So leadership is a critical piece of governance. There might be committees, working groups, special interest groups, or other groups who help lead various areas around the project. At a minimum, there should be some kind of documentation about leadership within the project, including how, who those leaders are and how they're selected. Ideally, there should be a fair and transparent process for selecting leaders with leadership seats held by individuals with not just the right expertise, but also enough time to actually lead the project. As mentioned earlier, we do have a viability metrics model for governance that's designed to look at several areas to see if the project is well governed and that the maintainers and other project leaders are actually taking good care of that project.
These metrics look at things like issue inclusivity, which looks at whether issues are well labeled to make it easier for people to find something to work on. Responsiveness metrics like time to close, change request closure ratio, and issue age determine if maintainers are keeping up with contributions and responding to them in a timely manner. Lib years and release frequency indicate whether maintainers are keeping dependencies up to date and making sure that updates and fixes actually land in a release in a timely fashion. Now, in addition to the metrics, it's also a good idea to have someone read through the governance documents to look for any potential red flags, especially for projects that are critical to your products or your users. A few common red flags might include lack of a process for removing leaders or maintainers who maybe aren't acting in the best interest of the project. Sadly, that happens. Uh, leadership seats allocated to organizations instead of individuals and unclear processes for selecting leadership, just to name a few red flags. The community is a critical part of assessing the viability of an open source project. Is the community active and engaged in productive discussions around the project? Are they helpful when people have questions or problems? Are they welcoming for new contributors and new users? Do they treat each other with kindness and respect? You want to look carefully at how people treat each other in discussions, code reviews, Slack, other communication channels. Projects with a culture of treating each other with respect and kindness are going to be more viable because people will want to continue to contribute. On the other hand, projects with toxic cultures put community members at risk. There could be real health risks, both mental and physical, and these toxic environments can impact the retention of your employees who contribute because they might be so eager to leave that project that they'll look for another employer where they won't have to work in that toxic community. Now, if the culture is too toxic, there is a real chance that the project could stagnate or even cease to exist if too many people leave, which could result in a project that becomes unviable over time. And while there are general community metrics that can indicate whether a community is healthy, it's still a good idea, again, to go beyond the metrics and have someone look at the community communication channels and see how people behave towards each other. There are so many abandoned open source projects sort of sprinkled around the internet, and there's no single reason why projects are abandoned, right? Technologies evolve, people change priorities, or maybe the community loses interest for whatever reason. One thing that can reduce the risk of embracing an open source project is if the project is adopted by a bunch of other people and a bunch of other companies, since active projects with loads of users are less likely to be abandoned. Having a strong user base reduces the risk that the project might be abandoned. If you're actively using an open source project, it's likely that you will find bugs or want to contribute fixes back upstream. So for projects you're using, you want to make sure that maintainers and other contributors typically respond in a timely fashion. Seeing large numbers of issues and pull requests on a project is a red flag for me, because it can indicate that they either don't have enough contributors to handle the incoming requests, or even worse, that they don't actually care about or want contributions from others, which sadly is something you do see in some company-owned open source projects. Open source projects that are design designed to keep diversity, equity, and inclusion top of mind will be more likely to continue to be viable over the long term. Having a code of conduct and providing an environment where everyone, including people from marginalized populations, feel safe and welcome is an important indicator of viability. You should also look at whether the project has a diverse set of people at every level within the project, but especially in those leadership positions. Projects that make a concerted effort to bring in new people from a variety of backgrounds and have programs in place to help them grow into leadership positions are more likely to be viable, benefit from increased innovation, and just have an overall healthier community. Diversity and inclusion can be difficult to measure, sadly, and it usually involves at least a partly manual assessment or other techniques like surveys, for example. So this isn't included directly in the metrics model that I'll talk about next, but we have defined some metrics within the Chaos Project's diversity, equity, and inclusion working group. 
that you can look at for ideas about how to measure various aspects of a project's diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now, one thing you'll notice is that some metrics appear in multiple viability models. So for example, change request closure ratio is a responsiveness metric that isn't just related to governance and maintainers, but also relates strongly to the viability of the community as a whole, as I talked about earlier. So metrics like clones, forks, and project popularity, they don't actually tell you much about the health of a project, but they can indicate that there's interest in a project and in contributing to a project. And again, projects with good adoption in an active community can be an indicator of viability, especially if those metrics are growing over time. Types of contributions is a particularly important type of metric for viability. Change requests and committers are a great start, but you should also look for a wide range of contributions happening beyond just the code. Things like documentation, community management, accessibility, and loads of other roles can show that you have a well-rounded community of people working on all aspects of the project, which also improves viability. Now, people often worry about the security for open source projects under the premise that if everyone can see the code, they might be able to find and exploit security vulnerabilities. Um, but the flip side of this, of course, is that there are also more people who can view the source code for the purpose of fixing those security vulnerabilities. And what this doesn't mean is that open source projects are automatically secure. Nothing is. One thing I look for when assessing the viability of open source projects is whether they're making regular releases and quickly patching security vulnerabilities. You should look at the project's security policy documents to make sure that they have a solid process for allowing anyone to privately report security vulnerabilities and for dealing with those reports quickly and efficiently. They should also have an embargo process for privately notifying the companies who use their projects in their products to give these companies time to apply security fixes before the vulnerability is made public. This can't be easily automated using metrics, unfortunately, but it's worth a manual look for projects that are important to you. From a strategic standpoint, having the time to update your products in advance of the public knowing about a vulnerability is really critical. And in short, projects that take a proactive approach to addressing security vulnerabilities and releasing fixes are going to be more viable over the long term. One good way to evaluate the security of an open source project is with the OpenSSF scorecard, which contains a wealth of information about the security of a project beyond just that score. Defect resolution duration, lib years, and other dependency measures are also important because projects that are slow to fix vulnerabilities and update dependencies will be less secure, which makes them a less viable solution, since you do not want to ship your products to customers if they contain open source projects that have shoddy security practices. License compliance is also critical, so it's important to look closely at the licenses that are used in an open source project. This is one aspect of viability that can make or break whether you can actually use that open source project or include it within your product. We don't always spend enough time thinking about contributor sustainability for open source projects. For any open source projects we rely on, are there enough contributors that if one of them won the lottery and retired on a beach tomorrow, could the project continue with minimal disruptions? You should also look at organizational diversity as part of the health and risk for open source projects. If all or most of the contributions are from employees at a single company, what happens when that company has a shift in strategy? or gets acquired, or even worse, runs out of money and just completely goes out of business? Would the project be able to continue if a company pulled all of its employees out of the project? These single vendor open source projects might not seem risky, but they can quickly become unviable after a licensing change, a la Elasticsearch, or when everyone just stops working on a project. Bus factor, also sometimes called the lottery factor, looks at contributor sustainability and whether a project is likely to continue if one or more people left. Elephant factor is a similar metric, but for organizations. And used with, along with organizational influence, can give you a sense for how many organizations are involved in a project. If these numbers are high, with loads of people contributing and good organizational diversity, the project is a lot more likely to be viable over the long term. 
But if most contributions are made by a single person or people from a single company, you might want to think twice about whether this project is a viable solution for your organization. Programming language can also be a concern, especially for smaller organizations. If your employees are mostly familiar with Python, then a project written in Java might be very difficult to manage and contribute to if you find a bug. And in this case, projects and languages your employees know well might be more viable for you to use. Most business decisions boil down to an assessment of risk and making trade-offs. We should all be thinking strategically about project risks in light of how we're using these projects within our own businesses. If we build products on top of an open source technology, we want it to be as low of a risk as possible. On the other hand, if we're using an open source project as some small part of some tiny non-critical infrastructure, then we can accept a lot more risk. And throughout this presentation, I talked about how to assess viability and how it often comes down to thinking about it from a perspective of risk and which risks you should accept. But it's also important to think about which risks you might be able to mitigate. The best way to mitigate a lot of these risks is by paying some of your employees to contribute to these projects. This gives you an opportunity to help out in various ways to make the project better overall. But it also gives you more insight into where the project is heading and how things are going so that if something changes in the project to further increase risk in the future, you're more, more, more likely to know about it if you have employees working directly in that project. Before I wrap up this talk, I'll leave you with a few resources you might find useful. Uh, Chaos Project has tools, metrics, metrics models, all measuring aspects of project health and project viability. Anyone's welcome to join us. You can find our meeting calendar and links to our Slack workspace from that link on the top. The to-do group, of course, has loads of guides and resources that have great info about all aspects of using open source projects. The Open Source Way Guidebook is another one of my favorite resources. It just has loads of details about building and maintaining open source projects. And these are all really great starting places for understanding project viability and open source in general. The ease in adopting open source can lead organizations to using software without actually considering its long-term viability. Not all open source projects are created equal, and some will be more viable than others over the long term. The success or failure of the open source projects you use can have real business implications. What happens when a project changes the license, stops making security updates? or as other issues that impact your usage of that project. When a project that's incorporated into your projects or products or services later becomes unviable, it can have negative implications for your users, your customers, and your reputation. It's worth spending time to critically assess whether a project is likely to be successful and continue to meet your needs over the long term. Open source project decisions have strategic implications that should be proactively evaluated to identify the risks that can be mitigated. Ultimately, whether an open source project is viable for you boils down to balancing the risk versus reward for your particular use case. Project viability, like most things, exists on a continuum. And we should think about project viability and make informed decisions about which projects to use. Understanding open source project viability is also an ongoing process that needs to be monitored and decisions revisited as those projects evolve. So with that, thank you. I will, as a reminder, let you know the slides are on that fastwonderblog.com on the speaking section. So if you want to download the slides, you can get them from there. And with that, I guess I'll open it up to any questions. Thanks for your talk, Don. Uh, I'm going to start with one anonymous question for you. Do you have tips on how to maintaining contributors? Tips on maintaining con uh, contributors. I actually have a whole other talk that talks about how to build your contributor base for your open source project. Um, it's it's hard. I mean, that's a that's a big topic. Um, I think that there, there are lots of things that you can do that help, you know, having things like good first issues, talking to your users and seeing if they're interested in contributing. Um, I, there's, 
there's definitely a lot a lot to be done around growing your growing your contributor base. It's sadly not something I can easily answer in a minute or less. Other questions? Yeah, there's more questions. I'm gonna come over here. <laughs> one, in the back too. one in the back. Oh yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you so much. It was great. It's just my first uh, introduction to this uh, rubric, but not my first introduction to uh, the Chaos Project. Is there a way to apply these metrics in like some type of rubric? Does that exist with us right now, or it, like is there like a form or certain some type of tool we can do to do to use this? Uh, we're working on that is is the short answer to that. So we do have we have tools. There are two tools within the Chaos Project. There's a tool called Augur, um, which does have uh, most of these metrics in the metrics models. There's also a tool called Grimoire Lab, which also has most of the metrics in these metrics models. One of the things that Gary White at Verizon is working on is is really how to implement this so that we have you know something that you can run that helps you assess viability and something that you can keep monitoring over time. So we have we have all the bits and pieces and we're just working on trying to pull something together to make it easier for people to do this. That's a good question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. We have one more question here. Do you think there's risk of single vendors projects hiding this reality by donating it donating it? To a foundation? I'm afraid to answer this question. Um, uh, yes, actually, this, this happens a lot. Uh, so you see this. So as I said earlier, I do have a role in the CNCF um, as a co-chair of the Contributor Strategy Technical Advisory Group. But we do see this. We see projects. I would like to, I would like to think that none of them do this maliciously to, to hide their contributions. But what we do see a lot in the CNCF is projects that are contributed by a company, and then most of the maintainers and contributors continue to work at that company. And they don't do a great job of pulling in contributors and maintainers from, from other organizations. So, so you do certainly see things that look an awful lot like a single vendor project inside some of these neutral organizations, which is why it's really important when you're assessing viability not just to look at whether it's um, at a company or at a foundation, but also look at the contributors, look at the organizations that contribute. Does it look more like a company-owned project or does it look more like a neutral, neutral project from a foundation? So it's important, that's why it's important to assess viability across kind of all four of these areas. Mm -hmm. One more question from the audience. Yeah, thank you as well for the talk. It's a very important topic. Um, I have a short questions and so many other long ones, which I will ask you later, which is, um, would you consider uh, CLAs as a potential risk as, uh, as a red flag uh, in terms that this might make it easier for single vendor projects to become proprietary? Uh, yeah, I would say that that is, that is one risk. So a lot of the single vendor projects that we've seen do things like relicensing were under contributor license agreements. Um, I think there are also projects that, are, that have contributor license agreements that are maybe, maybe not as, as risky, but I do think it's, it's definitely one thing that you should, you should look at, for sure. I mean, my preference is always the developer certificate of origin, personally, the, the signed off by. Um, but I've worked at companies where when I, when I worked at Puppet, they decided uh, to keep this, the contributor license agreement and, and not move to the developer certificate of origin because it looked better to investors. Um, not for any reality, you know, anywhere, but it, 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 you know, from a perception standpoint, if we were to get acquired at some point in the future, which of course Puppet did, um, the idea was that if there was a CLA that that made it look better. To, to people. So there are companies that do that, even though there was no maliciousness in having the CLA in that particular case. All right. Thanks a lot. We're out of time, unfortunately. But I'm sure um, you can keep up the discussion over coffee afterwards. Thank you, Don Foster. Thank you.